So today we are covering a variation or line that is very, very popular among a beginner to advanced beginner to intermediate players and for good reason. And that is that white's results are really, really good in this line. Um, black has to be very, very careful in order to not end up in a losing position. There's a lot of traps along the way. And even if black manages to sidestep every single trap and play computer perfect, which they almost never will, but even if that happens, the position is around equal. If anything, slightly better for white. So sounds almost too good to be true, but uh, that is the Max Lang attack. So first of all, how do we get the Max Lang? It's after the moves, whoops, after the move e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, the Italian, bishop to c5, castle, knight f6. And the reason, by the way, why this is the second video where we're talking about e4, e5 positions, um, the reason why it, it fits very well, it complements very well with the other one, which is on the Deutz Gambit, and I suggest you check it out if you want the full repertoire, it's that when we play our Gambit move pawn to d4, here black can uh, take either with the bishop or with the pawn. We also looked at in the last video uh, taking with the knight, but it's not, a, it's not a good move. That's the spoiler for you. Um, so bishop takes d4 is considered best by the professionals, and um, that was the subject of the Deutz Gambit video. But today we're going to talk about pawn takes d4. So in this case, after pawn takes d4, what we have is this strong idea of pawn e5. And we immediately hit their knight. And the great thing about this is that black already needs to know uh, one move and one move only in order to stay uh, in the game. And that is the move pawn to d5, which is not easy to find if you're a player uh, who, from the black side, has never seen this before. So pawn to d5, ignoring the attack on the knight and hitting our bishop is the best way to go. What's wrong with the other moves? Well, let's take a look. If knight to g4, the move bishop f4 is best. We just defend our pawn on e5. And almost always black actually castles here. And the point is now as white, we have the simple move h3. We kick their knight back. That's the only square that they can go to. And now we take their knight, pawn takes, and we simply continue our development. c3, target their strong central pawn, pawn takes, knight takes. And we have a better position because of their damaged uh, pawn structure on the king side. Their king is going to be unsafe for a lot of the game. So this is uh, the way to go as white against knight to g4. If instead of knight g4, they go for knight e4, some players do this. This is even worse. Now we're just completely winning. Uh, I think the easiest way to win is rook e1. We hit their knight. And the point is the knight has no good squares to go to because let's say they went here. We would just pick up the knight. And um, other than that, the only square, the only way to defend the knight is to go d5 or f5. But both of these moves are uh, losing moves. f5 is just a disaster. We take en passant. Now their knight is hit. They try to defend the knight again. But we take again on g7. They can play rook g8. And now there's a few ways to win, but even a simple one is to take this knight on e4. Just crash through because after pawn takes... Now we can pick up this rook, they can pick up our knight, and it's been a massive exchange of, of uh, material. But after queen takes f3, we each have the same number of pieces, but be, ver be very careful with this pawn on g7. How are you going to stop it? Your king is completely, um, completely naked, basically. It has no pawn cover, and uh, yeah, black, black is just entirely lost here. So, um, and, and if... If instead of f5 they go they begin with d5 it's a similar story we take here now after f5 at least we're not chopping here on g7 so it's not as bad but um one one way in which we can just play that i like is knight d2 we hit their knight now we just take and now we take again with check and well their king is just stuck in the middle of the board and if they try to play a move like knight to e7 we can just even continue to take pawns uh, we're not worried about moves like d5 because we have checks. And, um, well, you can look at this position if you want, but, you know, you're not going to lose a piece. That's the one important thing to keep in mind. For example, if g6, we can go bishop b5 check. Um, and now our bishop is no longer forked. And if they go, let's say, king f7 or something like this, now we can remove our queen. And once they uh, move the king, now we can start to think about moving our rook, right? We can even do something like rook h4 
or uh, we even have beautiful tactical ideas like queen c3. There's a million different ways that you can continue as white against this, but the important thing to know is that uh, we're completely winning here. Just to show the last, the end of this line, if they take a rook, then we have knight e6 with uh, as powerful a fork as you're going to get. We're attacking everything and we're even throwing a double check in for good measure. So this is no good for black. So this all started with the position. Let's rewind this position here where after we target their knight, if it moves anywhere, they're in trouble. So what they should do is go d5. Now we take their knight and we sacrifice our bishop. We're down a pawn, but um, there's a couple of ways we can continue here. But for me, the nicest way to continue is rookie one check. We give this check and we basically force them to play one of two moves, either bishop e6, blocking the check, or they can go king f8, which would um, sidestep the check. Now, part of the reason I like rook e1 is because I think after king f8, we can get a really nice position with a very, I think, devilishly tricky move. And that is the move knight to d2. So it looks as though with knight d2, all we want to do is maybe take that pawn on c4. And this is why we catch so many players out with this line. Almost every uh, player that I saw, what they do here is they play queen takes f6, which I think it's, you know, you can't blame them, right? They want to get that pawn. It's a thorn in their side. And it looks as though after knight takes c4, they're going to have a good position, and they will. And even if they find this move knight e4, which is our idea, most players will miss the follow-up. So what most players do is they defend the bishop, and they figure queen e7 or queen f5 should do it. Now, if they go queen e7, you can win on the spot. You go bishop to g5. Now, their queen cannot continue, cannot move, and still defend the bishop. And if they go f6, thousands of games or maybe hundreds of games have ended exactly like this. Knight takes f6. We're hitting their queen. They do, they're not in time to take the knight. We're going to have rook e8 check ideas as well to just pick up this rook. So the position is completely lost for them. The uh, better move is queen to f5. And this one is, I mean, we have to know it, we have to study it, but it's absolutely beautiful. So here's the idea. We take their bishop, queen takes c5, and now you can pause the position if you want, but there is only one move that wins for white here. Everything else is around equal or black is even better. But with one move, white just breaks apart collapses the black position. So I will show it now. That move is pawn to b4. Such a difficult move to find, but what's the idea? Well, the idea is that black's king has problems along the back rank, so it cannot easily shift away to g8. And the importance of pattern recognition, not only spotting the back rank pattern, but spotting that the king and queen are aligned on the same diagonal. It's these two things that come, to, come together and with b4, the point is this. If black plays queen takes b4, we now play a4. It's just amazing to go b4 and a4, and it's game over. Why? Because our threat is bishop to a3. We couldn't do this, you know, if we just played a4 here while our bishop was stuck behind the pawn. But by hitting the queen, using the initiative, we, force the, uh, we invite the queen, rather, to take our pawn and now after a4, bishop a3 is coming, and it's going to be uh, game over. You know, black can try something like, for example, queen d6, but we will go bishop a3 anyway. And if knight b4, to try and patch things up, we go c3. And we force that knight um, to, to, well, to be lost, basically. Because if black takes here, we can now take the knight. And once again, here, we haven't won their queen, but we've done even better. We have queen d8. Uh, is mate. So we sort of pull the queen away and then checkmate here on d8. So it's the back rank plus the threat of winning the queen that combines and uh, co costs black the game. And what and what if black doesn't play queen takes b4? Well, there's of course there's the option of knight takes d4, uh, sorry, knight takes b4, but this pulls the knight away from this pawn. And we can actually just take the pawn and the black position is really in serious trouble because our idea is going to be to go bishop a3, to follow up with c3. We have the uh, rook e8 ideas. So even though black is up a couple of pawns, we're, we're winning because of the um, brutal attack that we have uh, over the coming moves. We will win material. 
so that covers queen takes b4 and knight takes b4. The only other option is pawn takes b3 and try to survive this way. But after a takes b3, we're threatening bishop a3. And, uh, well, what black has tried sometimes, I mean, maybe the best uh, resistance here is b5, saying, let me stop bishop a3 by meeting it with pawn to b4. And now the, the beauty of the uh, white tactical ideas continues. We go c3 here, which is an incredible move. And what's the point with c3? Well, now we do have some bishop a3 ideas because b4 is going to be harder to pull off. And we're also threatening to take this pawn. So what black can do is to take our pawn in one of two ways. If they take with the queen, we have a, an amazing um, way of trapping the queen. We go bishop a3 check, they block, and now we go rook c1. And this is a, a situation I've almost never seen. The queen being trapped here on c3 is such a weird arrangement. I don't know if you guys have ever had a position like this in one of your games, but I don't remember this trap. So it's a nice one. The queen is just uh, is just gone. And okay, what if d takes c3? This one is probably my favorite of the whole line here. Um, you can win in a few different ways. Like you could do things like knight e5 here to use the fact that if this knight takes, you've got queen d8. Um, but the prettiest move, in my opinion, is, uh, is an incredible idea. And it is this. It's rook a5. And well, rook a5, first of all, is this not just dropping the rook? The point is, if black takes, we have queen d8 again with the same back rank pattern. But the next question is, what is even the idea behind this? Is it to put pressure on this b pawn? In fact, it's not. Uh, we can see that, let's say that black tries something like h6 so that we can, so that he can play king g8, king h7, escape, no more back rank uh, threats. Now we see the idea. Bishop goes to a3. And uh, you don't have b4 because of the rook pressing the queen uh, from a5. And that's actually the, the brilliant idea behind this. So difficult to spot in a real game, but uh, in my opinion, very beautiful. You might be asking yourself, uh, why not knight b4? But again, remember, just because of h6, black still needs to squirm away from f8, and they're, they're too late here. We go queen d8 and we checkmate. So um, such a pretty line, in my opinion. And of course, you're not going to remember exactly these, these moves, or maybe you will. It's, it's up to you, of course, if you want to study them. But, uh, you know, I think it's a really nice concept to show the power of initiative. When you're uh, down maybe a pawn or two, but you have, a, um, you have a better king safety and you have better place pieces, don't be afraid to give another pawn or maybe even another piece in order to accelerate your attack. Here, b4 breaks down the black position by being the most active, most energetic uh, move, targeting the queen, um, whereas any other slower move would have given up uh, white's advantage and allowed black to um, sort of, what we say in chess, to consolidate their position. Okay, so um, this is if king f8, knight bd2, we get this trap with queen takes f6. So what if, what if not that? What if bishop to e6? Well, that's probably the best move. And now I recommend to take the pawn on g7, rook to g8, and bishop to g5. And again, we set our next trap. And the point is this. Almost always, what black plays here is they go queen d5. This has been played thousands of times, but it loses on the spot. And the trick to know is knight to c3. Because now we're hitting the queen, and if they take our knight, then we go queen takes queen. And they cannot take our, our queen because of this, uh, this attack. So what can they do? Well, the reasonable square would be to put the queen on f5, but now comes knight to e4, and the threat is knight f6. Now, black can stop this in one of two ways. They can either take this pawn, or they can go bishop to e7. Sometimes players go bishop e7, but here after we swap off the bishops, we can take our pawn on d4, and we can get this position. And it may not look like so much, but if you count the pawns, we're actually up a pawn. Their king is incredibly unsafe. Their pawn structure is very bad. And our knight is much better than their bishop. So everything adds up. And the position is actually completely winning for white. But even easier to win is when black, instead of uh, going bishop e7, instead of that, they take this pawn. 
And here, again, what an interesting pattern that doesn't happen very often out of the opening, knight h4. We hit their queen, and incredibly, there is just no good square for the queen. So why is, why is that? If queen f6, we've got knight, if queen g4, we've got knight f6, check, with a fork. If queen back to d5, it's the same check. If queen e5, we go knight f6, and we pick up the queen via the discovery. So there's just no good square. The queen is lost, and uh, with it, the game. All right, so after bishop g5, we know that the move queen d5 is a big, big problem, and we can win. And, it's, and we also know it's the most popular move that black goes for. It's the most common move. So we're going to win a lot of games just straight off the bat like that. But what happens if black plays better moves? Well, there's queen d7 and bishop e7. They're the only moves that don't lose. So let's talk about queen d7. After queen d7, we just continue our development, that last minor piece that needs to develop. And it's a similar plan. After rook takes, we put our knight on e4. We're threatening knight f6 and we're threatening this bishop. Of course, it's not as uh, powerful as the last time because the last time when the queen went here, we were able to jump with the knight and then jump again and get that much faster because of the, um, because of the tactic on the queen. Here, they can go bishop e7, they stop it, and after bishop takes e7, they can uh, play queen takes e7. That's the best move. Knight takes d4, and what they usually try here is they castle. Now knight takes knight, pawn takes, and we get the queen out of the way, and the pawn structure is so bad for them that we are the ones who stand better. This is not the only way that black can play. Maybe they have some better options, but this is what they usually do, and... Um, you can see that uh, the position is very bad for black. So this is also not so easy for black. So what do we do um, if we're black here? And we don't like queen d7, we don't like queen d5. The only other option is bishop to e7. So if they go for this, we take their bishop, and now it's a branch in the tree. They can take with the king or they can take with the queen. Some players, they like to take with the king because they figure my queen now is on d8, and that way they can't take my pawn on d4. And that's fair enough, but we can actually still chase it with rook e4. They'll try and hang on to it with d3, but that gives us the option to develop our knight to the best square with c3. They can now uh, take our pawn, but we hunt down this d-pawn, and we force them to take, otherwise we will just take it on the next move. We force them to take, and we get this position, and we can see the rook is going to slide in. Uh, let me take the arrows off for a second. We see that... Uh, we're down one pawn, but actually, even though we're down a pawn, look at their king, look at their pawn structure, look at our wonderfully placed knights, and we can see actually only white can be better here. In fact, they are, uh, we are a lot better here. So you can play this middle game safe in the knowledge that, you know, with moves like rook to d1, maybe knight d5 check, maybe knight e4, maybe knight h4, um, you know, maybe even queen e4, so many different options depending on what black does. But, uh, you know, white's chances are very, very good. And it's hard to play this position for black with such an unsafe king. So this is if black plays in this position, if they just take the bishop uh, with the king. But what if they take with the queen? Well, the drawback here, and this is, in my opinion, the best move, the drawback, nevertheless, is that we can grab this pawn on d4. So we should take it. And now what black normally does is they castle queenside. Let me show you what I think is the only way to approximate equality in the entire line, in the entire Max Lang uh, sequence that we've been looking at. That is the very hard to find, but very clever point of rook d8. Now, most players, as I, as I just mentioned, they, most, they mostly castle queenside because that's natural. You wanna bring your king to safety, but this has a, a big problem. The reason why rook d8 is better is because after, let me show, after queenside castle, what we're going to do is we're going to take this knight on c6. And if they take our queen, we're going to take their queen with a check, force their king to move, and then pick up the rook. The reason why rook d8 is better is because in this position, if they go rook d8, we don't have that idea. Because if we take here, rook takes, and we take their queen, it doesn't come with any check. I, I think <laughs> maybe I don't need to highlight that the knight is not checking the king. Um, but, you know, it doesn't come with any checks, so they can take us, and that's certainly a check, or more than a check, it's checkmate here on the back rank. So, be very, very careful with this, if your opponents happen to play, you know, basically perfect, which won't happen most of the time. But let's say rook d8, what would you do here? Well, just defend your knight with c3, they can pick up this pawn, and now just 
get out of this pin, queen f3. Yeah, it's true that they can win a pawn here uh, with rook takes d4, but if they do so, our queen on f3 is going to snatch up this one on b7, which would be a re an exchange we'd be really happy about because that pawn on b7 means that their entire queenside pawn chain is just wrecked, basically. So instead, what black should probably try is c6. Now we develop, we let them take this pawn on d4 anyway, we get rid of their best piece, which is the rook, and we get a position like this. And you might be looking at it and say, well, we're down a pawn, aren't we worse here? In fact, the position, the computers say it's around equal, but slightly better for white. But from a human perspective, you know, if you're playing this, I would certainly much rather be white. Why? Because my king is safe, their king is not, and it's going to be hard for their king to be safe for the rest of the game because their pawn structure is not good like ours. Um, and on top of this, we have active threats like queen d4, hitting the rook and the pawn. We can bring our knight into play and target the dark squares. So we have a lot of possibilities. So I really like um, this position, but this is pretty much the best that black can hope for. So um, this is if rook d8, as I say, most of the time they'll castle queenside. We'll take the knight on c6, pawn takes, we'll move our queen, they can take our pawn, and now we'll play knight c3. And again, we get this, you know, knight versus bishop, bad pawn structure, but much better for us than in the rook d8 ver ver uh, variation. And the reason for this is, look at their um, horrible pawn structure. And on top, of on top of that, in this particular position, we're not even down a pawn. They have six pawns, we have six pawns, but our pawns couldn't be, couldn't be better. Uh, you know, couldn't be a better pawn structure, um, whereas theirs would struggle to be worse, right? So that's the Max Lang. Um, that just about covers it. I really believe that if you know how to play the white side of the Max Lang attack extremely well, then I really believe it's going to be one of the openings that gets you the best results. If that's not the case, you wind up just taking one beating after another from the white side. Do drop a comment. I'd be curious to see what lines are catching you out. I may post some update videos in the future, but um, for now, I hope you've enjoyed this one. And remember that if you want the full sort of set of uh, what to do, the, um, all of the ideas of what to do to accompany the Max Lang, you should check out the Deutz Gambit video and that'll uh, make sure that you know what to do, whether they take with the pawn as in the Max Lang or they take with the bishop as in the Deutz. Okay. So that's it. Hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.